why is Mr. Trump going to stay on as executive producer of The Apprentice? Well, he's a very transparent guy. Everyone can see what he's doing. And the fact is that he is conferring with all types of experts to tell him what he is allowed to do and not to do as the president of the United States. And if this is one of the approved activities, then perhaps he'll consider staying on. You know, and I'm not saying that it's not allowed. I'm just saying that every hour he devotes to Celebrity Apprentice is an hour that he's not devoting to fill in the blank, for jobs, national security, whatever. <laughs> well... Okay, but were we so concerned about the hours and hours and hours spent on the golf course of the current president? I mean, presidents have a right to do things uh, in their in their spare time or their leisure time. I mean, nobody yeah. objects to that. And there's Wait been a, a lot of Everybody time spent. Everybody objected to that. I mean, I heard you object to Mr. Obama playing golf. Will Mr. Trump not be no. playing golf for the next four years? Uh, well, maybe he will be. Uh, it certainly seems like there's a lot of time to do it based on recent precedent while you're president of the United States. But the point is the same, that these, whether it's President Obama or President Donald Trump, the idea that these men are going to be all work and nothing else all the time, it's just unrealistic because it's never, it's never happened in our lifetimes. Um, but you know, I know Donald Trump very well, and I can tell you that work is his work and work is his hobby. Um, his preferred time is with his family. But it's followed very closely behind with work. He just, yeah. it's a mystery to all of us when he even sleeps. I'm sure he's watching us right now. And he's just all high energy, yeah. high octane, high activity. And, uh, and so, again, if right. the powers that be, if the lawyers and the protocol officers say that he can do that, then he probably is going to say, why not? He is a multitasker. That is true. And we all know that. But will he be collecting a salary? Doubtful. I think he's actually already said he will not keep the salary for President of the United States, which no, I, I mean, believe is about $400,000. Right. No, so. I mean, for a celebrity apprentice, will he be making a profit off it somehow with royalties or a salary? I haven't discussed that with him directly. However, uh, there are many options. He could do what he's going to do with his White House salary with a celebrity apprentice, which is donated to charity or refuse, decline to take it. Again, all of that will be decided. I don't think it's as relevant an issue, respectfully, as uh, the amazing cabinet he's putting together. Hi, I'm Bill O'Reilly. Thanks for watching us tonight. We're awaiting Donald Trump. He's expected to speak in Iowa anytime. So we'll take you out there when uh, Mr. Trump begins. For critics of Donald Trump, his president-elect posture is not a happy time, and that is the subject of this evening's Talking Points memo. It's a problem almost every president-elect has had. Certainly Barack Obama and George W. Bush experienced it. Those who opposed their election sought to undermine both men as soon as they won. That's happening now with Donald Trump. But here's the difference. With Mr. Trump, the undermining is occurring on both the left and the right. Case in point, conservative George Will, Washington Post columnist who also provides analysis for Fox News. Will despises Trump, feels that he is an intellectual inferior, and even left Will did, the Republican Party, because of Trump's nomination. Now, it's certainly George Will's right, as both an American and a analyst, to criticize not only Donald Trump, but any powerful person he wants. We have no beef with that. What is troubling, however, is that much of Will's negative analysis is driven by personal animus. And it is here that he does his readers and viewers a great disservice. Last night on Special Report, Will hammered Trump over the carrier situation. The problem is when you have, in the carrier case, political power used to bring pressure upon a privately held corporation that has a fiduciary duty to maximize shareholder value and drive them off with political pressure from making economic decisions about economic assets, you are in effect, at the end of the day, getting the federal government involved in capital allocation. There's a name for that. It's called socialism. Putting the annoying at the end of the day cliche aside, every hour of the day, Will's analysis is ridiculous. It is true that Car Carrier Corporation has an obligation to maximize profits. That's true. But if it does that by hurting the country in which it is operating, then the man in charge of that country, the president, is an obligation to challenge that. Under Will's analysis, which is absurd, any corporation hurting American workers should be left alone. Hey, it's their business. I'm doing what they want to do. Maximize profits. 
Does that sin make sense to you? Does it really? President Trump's obligation, his obligation, and it should have been President Obama's as well, but it wasn't, is to try to protect American jobs. So Trump had a conversation with Carrier, basically said, if you hurt your workers by moving to Mexico, expect that we will use legal tariffs to hold you accountable. That's not socialism. That's hardball economics. Socialism, as George Will should know, is the government actually running the economy, telling Carrier what they can charge for their products or what wages they have to pay their workers. That's socialism. Trump simply saying to every American company, we expect you to help the USA by finding a way to keep and create jobs here. And if you move abroad and jobs are lost, you will pay a legal price. Again, that's what President Trump should be doing. That's what President Obama did not do. And that's a big reason why wages for American workers are stagnant. Too many jobs have been moved overseas. Memo to George Will, drop the personal stuff. Tell the truth. And that's the memo. And joining me now is former House Speaker Newt Gingrich, who is also author of the new novel, Treason. Speaker, thank you for being here tonight. You were uh, sitting there listening to the president-elect's words in Iowa. What struck you about his speech just now? Well, part of it is the very calm delivery. If you watch, he has an almost soft tone now. He's reassuring people, going back over ground, maybe making a little broader, a little, more, a little clearer. Plus, uh, things like uh, introducing his new ambassador to Beijing, who turns out to be a close personal friend of the Chinese prime minister, uh, a relationship that goes back to the Chinese prime minister having come and spent time in Iowa. So it's more than just trade deals and uh, Iowa agriculture, but Terry Branstad is going to be a remarkable uh, spokesperson. And of course, Branstad is the longest serving governor in the history of the United States. So he has an enormous uh, level of talent and Iowans have loved him and I think he's going to be very effective. I think you're seeing Trump, you know, flesh out this cabinet and this, this key team with very, very competent, very uh, successful people. And it did seem like he was branching out. They're calling this his thank you tour. Uh, but there at the end, you heard him say, join this movement, believe in America. Uh, perhaps in addition to it being a thank you tour, it is reaching out to even those uh, that did not support him or did not vote for him. Yeah, I think that uh, President Trump believes that he can add 20 or 25 percent of the country to the base he already has, that as they get to know him, as they see what he's trying to do, that there will be a great deal of, of uh, people saying, you know, this guy really is trying to make America great again, uh, and he really is trying to make my life better. And I think that's why he's, I think he believes it has to be a movement. He knows it can't be him by himself, and he's talked fairly often for the last six months about the idea that this is a movement and that's what he really wants. I mean, Trumpism is more than Donald Trump. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of approaching problems. Uh, and I think that he is the beginning of a very new and very different chapter in American history. But perhaps, uh, Speaker, we are seeing the beginning of what could be a very big fight with one of his more recent uh, nominations, sure. Scott Pruitt, the Oklahoma Attorney General, as the head of the EPA. Uh, you just heard some of the criticism there, but Nancy Pelosi is saying this nomination must be blocked for the sake of the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the planet we, le we will leave our children. Democrats are in, in an uproar over sure. his nominating Pruitt. You know, this is a great shock to the Democrats. It turns out Donald Trump's actually a conservative. Uh, he actually believes in the things he campaigned on. He's actually going to do the things he promised to do. And for some left-wing Democrats, it's going to drive them nuts. Uh, Nancy Pelosi being a good example. If you spend your life in San Francisco, surrounded by San Francisco liberals, you are, are you're appropriately horrified by Donald J. Trump because he ain't you. Uh, but that's why he won. Uh, millions of people came out to vote. And as Trump was saying tonight, people... <clears throat> People registered. I ran into a 90-year-old woman in Georgia who had never voted, mm -hmm. who registered to vote for Trump. And I think that the left doesn't realize there was a big block of folks who want to send a signal to the left. We don't agree. Notice, when he said we're going we're to get the EPA out of your life, there was spontaneous applause in Iowa because farmers have seen 
the EPA is a major problem and a major headache for them well, just running a, their family farms. There was obviously a strategy there to, to meet with Al Gore and Leonardo DiCaprio and then announce Scott Pruitt as the head of the EPA. But our own Chris Dyerwald, Speaker, I wanted to run this by you. He's saying uh, that, that he poses an interesting case in his bid to get the 51 votes needed for confirmation. Not every Republican may feel comfortable voting for him. Do you see that happening? Is there going to be a big fight there? It could be. Uh, I think the, uh, you have to look and see. On the other hand, uh, there's some Democrats who may decide to vote for him. I think uh, Senator Manchin may end up deciding to vote for him. Uh, I also think that he's a very talented person. He's a very good attorney general of Oklahoma. He's very respected among attorneys general. Uh, and I think that as people get to know him, as he makes his case, you know, it is nonsense to suggest that Opposing EPA regulations that are stupid means you're for dirty air or you're for dirty water. Mm -hmm. You can, you know, we, we can have very clean air and very clean water yeah. and still have a limited rational government in Washington. And he reiterated, <coughs> the president-elect reiterated that campaign promise tonight. We heard that from him on the trail. And we heard right. it again tonight. Speaker Gingrich, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Good, Good to, to be you. with you. And here now with reaction is Fox News contributor, of course, the editor of Life Z and a nationally syndicated radio host. Laura Ingram is back with us. Laura, uh, I like the idea. You don't see many people. I remember Ed Koch always used to go out and thank people when he was the mayor of New York for their vote. I think the idea that you go out, not only thank them, but reassure them that what you promised during the campaign remains your agenda. You know, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir. I yeah, I think it's a great idea. And I think it, it, at this moment, Sean, Trump has a real opportunity to begin to expand the base of the electorate that he attracted on Election Day by continuing to preach the gospel of prosperity, uh, freedom, uh, independence, sovereignty, the rule of law, as applied to everyone, regardless of your skin color, your ethnicity. Uh, where you came from, if you're an American citizen, if you, you know, played by the rules, you're going to have a much better shot at having more money in your pocket, living a life in safety, and actually happiness if he does what he said he was going to do. And I think the reassurance is smart. I think he should keep doing this throughout his uh, four and perhaps eight years in office. And, and yeah. that'll drive the left crazy, but keep going into those areas where Republicans have traditionally had difficulty and continue to reassure and build on what he started. I'm going to do my opening monologue in the next segment, and that's about the collective left freakout, which is getting worse every day. But it seems like Barack Obama is jealous that he's not the center of attention, and apparently he's going to go out on his own tour, I guess, to try and steal the thunder from Donald Trump. I'm not sure exactly what he's going to brag on. It's certainly not going to be the number of additional millions of Americans in poverty and food stamps or the lowest home ownership rate <laughs> or doubling of the debt or Iraq, Afghanistan, China, Russia or Benghazi. So I'm not sure what he's going to say, but he did take a shot again. Remember when he said Bible thumpers clinging to their guns, Bibles and religion and that sort of thing. Here's what yeah. he said last night on CNN. There's a reason why attitudes about my presidency among whites in northern states are very different from whites in southern states. So you know, are, are, are there folks who, whose primary concern about me has been that I seem foreign, the other? Uh, are, are those who champion the birther movement, <laughs> you know, feeding off of uh, bias? Absolutely. So there is, attitudes about my presidency from whites in northern states is different from whites in southern states. Hmm. How do we uh, interpret that? Sean, it's both preposterous and pathetic. The idea that you can't harbor a negative view of Obama's accomplishments or lack thereof without being a racist if you're living in the South and are Caucasian means that the, it's, it's a different type of racism, and it's a different type of bias coming from the left. Again, they're always going to excuse failed liberal policies by trying to play some type of identity politics. Uh, and in this case, of course, it's the race card. This follows, of course, after uh, people like Eric Holder, who also brought this up a few years back, that the criticism of Barack Obama was based in race. When young people, uh, people in our generation, Sean, I, I don't care what color your skin is. If your policies work, if they respect the Constitution, they honor our time-tested values, 
they're going to work and Americans are going to, you know, like what you did. If you don't do that, it doesn't matter where you came from, doesn't matter what color your skin, there are a lot of Americans who are going to be unhappy with that. That's what happened with Obama. They personally like him, think he's a good father and a, and a, and a good guy, but they don't like the direction the country's gone in. More divided, l fewer jobs, more globalization, open borders. Uh, and all the rest. But the fall back on the race card, I mean, I guess you can't blame Bush anymore, so you just go with race. And stereotyping uh, Southerners, that's just the oldest uh, trick in the liberal playbook. And it, it's tired. It's just old and it's tired. But the problem I see for President Obama, and I'm speaking objectively, I mean, I always thought he was a radical, rigid, left-wing ideologue. He's never deviated from that. No sister soldier moment. The era of big no. government is over. The end of welfare. And as a result, there were people like us that were warning that statism, leftism, redistribution failed. His signature program, Obamacare, a disaster. There's no one economic uh, statistic that I can point to no. that points to success. And I would argue that he played a big role in the election of Donald Trump because of those failed policies. Well, he's doing a refutation tour now, Sean. Yeah. He, he, wa he, he wants the historians to write the history of his administration the way he wants it written. And so it's about racism. It's about those awful Southerners. It's about rigid ideology, where I think you're exactly right. He never left the campus. He's still at Harvard University agitating. He's still back on the street corner in Chicago community organizing. That's what his experience was. That's where he came from. And, I, and they always talk about how Trump has an, Trump is, has an evolved to be presidential. I think you can make the argument that Obama never evolved beyond the campus activist setting. He got stuck there and he never would leave it. There was no moment of, of recognition or self-reflection on, on maybe mistakes he made. Instead, it's Not always the other guy's fault. It's always but Fox News. It's talk radio. Are you worried at all about... Donald Trump meeting, you know, saying good things about Obama, meeting with Al Gore, Rombo Deadfish, uh, <laughs> Mitt Romney. Are, are you worried about him meeting with any of these people? Not if he stays true to his, his campaign promises, his policies, uh, the bedrock of, of restoring freedom and the rule of law, uh, sovereignty, economic prosperity. He has to stick to those uh, core principles. It doesn't matter in the end who he, with whom he meets if he does the things that he said he was going to do. And I know there's always going to be compromises necessary, but those core values that he ran on and that he won on, he's got to stick to that. Yeah, and, agreed. and I think a lot of people are going to be watching very carefully, and I, I think people are hopeful for good reason. All right, Laura, always good to see you. Thank good you so much you. for being with us. In that statement tonight, still mystery surrounding the appointment of Secretary of State. Where has Rudy Giuliani gone? Join us now from Washington, Fox News National Security correspondent Jennifer Griffin. So, um, you know all these sources, and you're like <laughs> meeting people at 2 a.m., and they're whispering to you. So give me a rundown what the Secretary of State situation is like. Well, I actually did have a conversation this evening, Bill, that gave me a, a little bit of the lay of the land for the Secretary of State pick. And right now I'm told that Rex Tillerson, the ExxonMobil uh, chairman who met with Donald Trump at Trump Tower on Tuesday, that his stock is really rising. Uh, he has the benefit of not only having run a country, a company that is in 50 countries, including war toward Yemen. He has long relationships with Vladimir Putin from his work in Russia, going back to the Yeltsin era. Uh, Donald Trump, I'm told, was very impressed with him, and I'm told to expect another meeting in the coming days. All right, so the man's name is Rex Tillerson. Tillerson is the CEO of ExxonMobil, businessman, obviously. Um, I'm not sure whether the Iranians, you know, because that's the Secretary of State's top job. If Trump is going to do something about the Iran nuke deal. But I don't know, uh, Mr. Tillerson, and I'll take your word for it. What about, what about Mitt Romney? Is he uh, still in the hunt? Mitt Romney is still in the mix. Uh, there are concerns in the Trump camp that that speech he gave in March to the Hinckley Institute, in which he said that Donald Trump would be dangerous as president, that that would follow him from capital to capital as he uh, made his way around the world, and that they just are concerned that they may not be able to get beyond that. And there also are concerns that since he was not close to Donald Trump during the election, uh, does he really speak for the president uh, once he is in charge? Uh, so. 
concerns about Romney. You also have Rudy Giuliani, who you mentioned. He has not been seen uh, coming in and out of Trump Tower uh, by our producers who've been staked out there for the last two weeks. I'm told that he is a little bit on the outs right now, uh, that uh, President-elect Trump was very uh, put off, if you will. Uh, he was offered DHS chief. Um, he turned it down. Department of um, Homeland Security. Department so of Homeland could, he Security. He could have been the ICE czar, Giuliani, and he turned he it down been. outright? He turned it down, I'm told, that he could yeah. have had it. And, uh, of course, General uh, John Kelly, a four-star Marine, was offered that and has said that he would uh, accept that right. position. So that's a, a fine choice over at DHS. But Giuliani was also publicly touting, uh, saying that he wanted Secretary of State. He spoke at a Wall Street Journal CEO council recently uh, in mid-November, in which uh, Donald Trump, I'm told, was uh, somewhat put off by his publicly talking about how he would be the perfect Secretary of State. So he was lobbying uh, with the Wall Street Journal uh, people and Trump didn't like that, according to your sources, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Now, that being said, Rudy Giuliani was probably one of the closest people to Trump during the election. And yeah. as one source told me, you know, the two, he could finish, you know, the president-elect's Yeah, that's why everybody's surprised. So we, haven't, we haven't seen the mayor and we don't yeah. know where he is. And I thought yeah. he might be at your house having snacks. <laughs> Now, we're looking at uh, Vice President-elect Pence. He's in Iowa, going to warm up the crowd for Donald Trump. Um, so when Mr. Trump comes on, we'll take that speech. Now, what about uh, General Petraeus, former CIA chief? Is he still in the running for Secretary of State or anything else? Excellent, excellent question. Um, I think that once the four-star Marine General John Kelly was chosen for DHS, it makes it very difficult for Donald Trump to choose another uh, retired four-star to be his Secretary of State. That being said, I'm told from sources very close to Donald Trump that he really liked uh, General Petraeus when he met with him. They spoke for over an hour. It was a, a meeting of minds. So I think they are still trying to find a position for General What about General going Petraeus. back to the CIA? Uh -huh. Well, remember Pompeo. Mike Pompeo it has already been offered that position. Oh, so I that forgot position that. Isn't, oh, yeah. I'm so that's very, not thank open. you for correcting me. Um, <laughs> so Pompeo is going to be CIA chief. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of other chiefs. There's like DIA chief. D, D, and well, DNI, DNI, uh, Director of National Intelligence. That would oversee the 17 intelligence agencies. I wouldn't rule that out yeah. as a possibility. NSA, I National Security yeah. Agency, those secret yeah. guys. Again, um, I think the concern. I think the concern is that they don't want to be accused of having a junta. They don't want so ma uh, too they, many generals. Too many generals, but at the same time, the generals are the ones that uh, Donald Trump seems to uh, be relating the most to. I like those tough guys, Jennifer. Thanks very much. We appreciate it. I mean, now with more Katrina Pearson, former Trump campaign national spokesperson, and Robert Wolf, former economic advisor to President Obama and Fox News contributor. Katrina, I'll start with you first. We had this big announcement, Thanksgiving job, over a thousand, uh, Thanksgiving day, over a thousand jobs were going to be saved at the carrier plant in Indiana. And then in the Wednesday that followed, we heard from that union leader, Chuck Jones, say he pulled it off. The man deserves credit, he even said, for what he did for these carrier folks, without a doubt. A week passes, Katrina, and he's saying he's lying his you-know-what off. What so drastically changed? Well, I think that's a question you should ask the union leader, but we do know if you criticize the president-elect, you get to go on TV all day, and that's exactly what's been happening over the last couple of days. But, you know, there's really no breaking news with the simple fact the president-elect defended himself on Twitter after being publicly attacked. And viciously, might I add, I can't even repeat exactly what he said because of the expletive that was involved in calling the president-elect a liar. But the fact is that the, the CEO of United Technologies, Greg Hayes, was with President-elect Trump and Vice President-elect Pence at the carrier plant to make the announcement that over a thousand jobs were saved. So is it a discrepancy in the numbers, Robert? What happened here? Well, I think, first of all, Chuck's protecting the workers who did not get saved. But I, I have to give credit to President-elect Trump. He saved 700 jobs or 1,100 jobs. Whatever the number is, that's good for the country. And, you know, my hope is that uh, once President-elect Trump's in office, he doesn't use Twitter out as his bully pulpit. He'll be the most powerful person in the world. You and have I a think, problem with his use of Twitter? 
Well, I, I think at, I think in 30 days, my hope is he'll do it much more strategic. He'll be able to have tax reform moving and things like that, and then he'll be able to make sure that you know things are made in America, people stay in America. I hope he doesn't do it with tariffs. I hope it's very much policy driven. But I mean, these are legal tariffs, and I, I know where you're going with this, Robert, because you and I have chatted a lot of business. Yeah. And your argument here, while you actually sound like you're pretty complimentary of what Trump has done here, is saying let's not go and threaten U.S. businesses. Let's provide a business friendly environment in which these companies thrive and naturally they keep those jobs here. Well, Funny to hear that from a guy who supported Obama for eight years, who many have urged him to do just that. Although, let's be clear, I am a, a capitalist at heart, and I think Obama did a great job in the economy. We could have a different debate on that. But we're talking about what President-elect Trump is going to do. And at the end of the day, we have to make sure that we have appropriate trade going back and forth. We can't have own, uh, tariffs that are onerous going each way. My view is, I think what he said tonight, it would be great if we could buy more in America, make more in America, and hire more in America. That's a, that's a great thing. I think by threatening companies is not the way to go. And like I said, I give him accolades on the carrier transaction. And I think that Chuck Jones, you know, you can figure out how to be um, disagreeable in a respectful way. I mean, mm -hmm. I had many people hit Obama over the years, and I'm not going to be one of All those. Right. Who go on TV and and hits president elect in a disrespectful way? I can disagree on his policies, and I hear that. And, and I think there's a better way to do it. Katrina, to Robert's point, the use of Twitter to go after a union president in this manner, the president elect going after this union leader. What did you make of that? Is that a good strategy? Well, you know, recently uh, the president elect also tweeted the fact that he's still using Twitter is because he will not get accurate coverage in the media. And so he defended himself, and that is not new. It's been something that the president-elect has done for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this, this same individual was on TV just yesterday saying that he had no idea of the terms that were negotiated, didn't know if the exact numbers were discussed, and, and didn't have a clue if Mr. Trump even knew what he was talking about. So how could you go on television and call someone a liar mm. when you don't even know the information that they had? And that is one of the criticisms. Of the yeah. union leader, shouldn't he have known more the specifics of this deal to react in one way only to change it a week later? Listen, outside of hitting uh, President-elect Trump on family, he hit him on the two things that you don't want to be hit on. He hit him on his brand, and he hit him on deal making. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, Trump's lying, and it's a bad deal. And so I'm not surprised right. that President-elect took it back at him in a harsh way. But I think in 30 days, we should get off Twitter and, and use his bully <laughs> pulpit in a more effective way. All right. But it's even been pretty if, effective but even if that for him, Robert. True, I've got to leave it there. Katrina, Robert, thank you. Hi, I'm Bill O'Reilly. Thanks for watching us tonight. We're awaiting Donald Trump. He's expected to speak in Iowa anytime. So we'll take you out there when Mr. Trump begins. For critics of Donald Trump, his president elect posture is not a happy time. And that is the subject of this evening's Talking Points memo. It's a problem almost every president elect has had. Certainly, Barack Obama and George W. Bush experienced it. Those who opposed their election sought to undermine both men as soon as they won. That's happening now with Donald Trump. But here's the difference. With Mr. Trump, the undermining is occurring on both the left and the right. Case in point, conservative George Will, Washington Post columnist, who also provides analysis for Fox News. Will despises Trump, feels that he is an intellectual inferior, and even left Will did, the Republican Party, because of Trump's nomination. Now, it's certainly George Will's right, as both an American and a analyst, to criticize not only Donald Trump, but any powerful person he wants. We have no beef with that. What is troubling, however, is that much of Will's negative analysis is driven by personal animus. And it is here that he does his readers and viewers a great disservice. Last night on Special Report, Will hammered Trump over the carrier situation. The problem is when you have, in the carrier case, political power used to bring pressure upon a privately held corporation that has a fiduciary duty to maximize shareholder value and drive them off with political pressure from making economic decisions about economic assets, you are in effect at the end of the day getting the federal government involved in capital allocation. There's a name for that. It's called socialism. Putting the annoying at the end of the day cliche aside, every hour of the day, Will's analysis is ridiculous. It is true that Car Carrier Corporation has an obligation to maximize profits. That's true. But if it does that 
by hurting the country in which it is operating, then the man in charge of that country, the president, has an obligation to challenge that. Under Will's analysis, which is absurd, any corporation hurting American workers should be left alone. Hey, it's their business. I'm doing what they want to do. Maximize profits. Does that make sense to you? Does it really? President Trump's obligation, his obligation, and it should have been President Obama's as well, but it wasn't, is to try to protect American jobs. So Trump had a conversation with Carrier, basically said, if you hurt your workers by moving to Mexico, expect that we will use legal tariffs to hold you accountable. That's not socialism. That's hardball economics. Socialism, as George Will should know, is the government actually running the economy, telling Carrier what they can charge for their products or what wages they have to pay their workers. That's socialism. Trump simply saying to every American company, we expect you to help the USA by finding a way to keep and create jobs here. And if you move abroad and jobs are lost, you will pay a legal price. Again, that's what President Trump should be doing. That's what President Obama did not do. And that's a big reason why wages for American workers are stagnant. Too many jobs have been moved overseas. Memo to George Will, drop the personal stuff. Tell the truth. And that's the memo.